The research findings highlighted in your lecture were impressive, and I felt a sense of awe toward your last comment on the slide. That was so impressive. And your journey started with plate tectonics and then led to snowball earth. Was there a specific moment that those two began to overlap and then reveal a larger story about earth evolution? Well, of course, if it wasn't for plate tectonics, uh, we'd still be in the snowball earth. <laughs> but of course, if it hadn't been for plate tectonics, the, the, the climate would have been gotten hotter and hotter, you know, continuously over geologic time because the sun has been getting brighter and brighter. And so the really interesting and basic problem was the, what was called the dim early sun paradox. How can it be that although there have been fluctuations in climate, overall there hasn't been much change for three or four billion years, despite the fact that the sun has been getting hotter and hotter. So there has to be a thermostat. And of course, the thermostat is carbon dioxide, which has been adjusting to a lower and lower level to compensate for the brightening, you know, for the brighter and brighter sun. And it's because it's self-adjusted because the removal of carbon dioxide through chemical weathering reactions that make soil is itself temperature dependent. So it works as a thermostat. I see. Uh, in the past, many people were skeptical about snowboard earth. So what inspired you to pursue research in that area? Yeah. Well, first of all, I thought that the, the implications for the evolution of life would be profound if, if it occurred. And I also thought that a lot of the criticism was premature because the nature of a snowball earth, I mean, for example, how the ice would, uh, would behave. Would there be ice on the continents? if the ocean was frozen. There are many, many things that were not, at that time, uh, well known. And so I thought a lot of the criticism was sort of a criticism of a parody of the snow. We didn't really know enough yeah. to know whether any given geological observation was either for or against the hypothesis. And, uh, but we, now we do, because there's now you know, close to 100 numerical simulations under various conditions. Of, and so we know much, much more about what a snowball earth is really like. So I thought that that was premature. But what drew me to, the, to the, the idea was because it was testable. Because, because the self-reversing snowball made these predictions about the duration, the synchronicity, and the nature of the aftermath. And there are a host of other geochemical predictions that fell from that. Um, when developing your snowball earth theory, uh, did you focus, start with collecting data, or did the broader concept come first. Yes, well, when I started working in Africa, actually snowballers wasn't the only motivation. There was a, there was a number of things that, that uh, came together, uh, which made that period of geologic time, which I had never worked on, and I'd never worked in Africa. Of course, it's totally different from working in the subarctic. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, but uh, so there was a number of, of different things of which snowballers was one, and, and of course, I, because I'm always like to have the context. Yeah. Those things, those other things, in the end, you know, fed into the uh -huh. snowballer problem. Now, the snowballer quickly, you know, became the, the focus of the uh, of the work because it had the most important uh, ramifications. But uh, the carbonate, that, you know, that I was saying that was also very important because that told told me where the ice was, where the ground was, you know, many, many details. So, um, you know, I always had the bigger picture and the bigger questions in mind, but I'm fanatical about the details because I, you know, I want the, the data to be as good as possible because I want to push it as hard as I can. You know, there, people think there are mega thinkers and micro thinkers, and I reject that, that, uh, that division. Uh, you know, I think you, <laughs> to me, you, you need to have the best possible data because you want to push it as hard as you can. So to me, there's no... Uh, uh. You were born and raised in Canada. Yeah. And how did growing up in Canada influence your decision to become a geologist? Yes, well, of course, Canada is a very large country, and it was at that time uh, dependent on natural resources, of which minerals were one. 
uh, much of the country has no population, or, or, or next to no population, much of it has no population whatsoever, so it's poorly known. There are no roads, very little access, so it's mostly working on foot. So there was uh, investment, there was public investment. Governments had geological surveys, universities had geology departments. And so there was a lot of encouragement and, and, uh, and I had fantastic support from, uh, from the Geological Survey of Canada who underwrote my, my research and, and, and support which you, you couldn't dream of from an academic uh, uh, environment at that time. Now that doesn't exist anymore. But uh, it, you know, I was very fortunate, uh, uh, as John Pendry said, uh, the post-war years were, were, were a year, uh, were, was a period of, of sustained economic growth that uh, has not occurred before or since. And it was also at a time uh, uh, when government invested in science and, and education, and I, neither of my parents finished high school, although they were, considered themselves and were intellectual people, but from circumstance. So I didn't have an academic background at all. But that didn't, you know, I, the opportunity was there. And, uh, and of course, if, you're, if you are being supported by public money, by taxpayers' money, yes. you have an obligation to work extra hard because right. you're, you're working with other people's money and you don't want to spoil it for, for other people. You want that, 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 uh, that, uh, so, that support to continue. So you treat it with great respect and, and you work as hard as you can to oh. make the best of, it, of such a glorious opportunity. So I have much to be thankful for. Oh, that's great. Uh, could you share some memorable moments from your research <laughs> trips uh, in <laughs> Namibia or Arctic Canada? <laughs> so the Eureka moment is a funny story about Snowball Earth. Uh, not about Snowball, but, but my conversion, so to speak. Uh, there was a visiting uh, scientist, Peggy Delaney, uh, from Penn State, was visit, visiting Harvard. I was at Harvard by then. And um, as you often do, the, the lecturer, the invite, like, you know, has a conversation with each faculty member for 20 minutes or so. And at that time, I'd done already four years of field work in Namibia, so I'd worked out the stratigraphy. I'd done a lot of isotope work with carbon isotopes, which is a way of telling how much organic activity is going on globally. And, uh, and, and I had this anomaly that suggested that there was almost no organic activity during the period of the glacial deposit. And so I was showing her this data and, and telling her what I th thought it might mean. And she said, oh, no, 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 you don't understand. You don't understand the time scale of the, of, of the carbon cycles. You should read this paper by Lee Cup. And, and so, I, so I went to her lecture and then we went out for dinner afterwards with the invited speaker. And of course, as soon as the dinner was over, I went back to the office and read Lee Cup's paper. <laughs> and the paper basically said if you shut down photosynthesis for a very brief time, you get a very small you know, change in the isotopes, but it recovers very quickly. The only way to get the kind of an isotope anomaly uh, that we were observing was to have no organic, no base, primary production in the ocean, no photosynthesis you know, for many multiples of the carbon cycle. So that's probably for millions of years. I said, well, how do you shut down photosynthesis for millions of years? Well, the snowball is the only thing that can do that. So that was kind of the moment of my, my conversion. And the joke is, I don't think that's the explanation for the carbon isotopes at all. <laughs> but it, it got me over the hump of, of thinking positively about it. And then, you know, so many other things started to fall into place. <laughs> wow. So when you go to uh, uh, research trips, how long? does it take uh, for each research trip? To go to the field? Uh, that's a really interesting question. It, it takes me, and I think most of the students as well, it takes, a, you know, to begin with, it takes about two weeks to learn how to walk like a goat. Oh, a goat. <laughs> Just to get used to the, you know, the, the kind of walking we do, because mm -hmm. Namibia is karst mountain, so it's very steep and sharp, and yes. you don't want to fall. And, and you've got to bounce around the outcrops and do field geology. So just to physically to get you know, into the routine, uh, it takes a couple of weeks. And then for, for a student, for example, and I like to train my students to be able to do their own independent you know, mapping as much as possible. You get more done and you no distractions. And I think it's safer because people pay more attention, no peer pressure. And, uh, but, but for a student, it takes you know, it takes three or four weeks to get used of the, of the geology in that area, so it takes time. 
And so this is not something you can you know, teach much about to students on a weekend field trip. Right. There's no substitute for the kind of apprenticeship job that I had, working as an apprentice for a geologist. And I think it's so important because if you're going to make a decision as what you're going to do in life, how can you make that decision unless you know what it would be like to do that thing? Okay? If you're an apprentice, you get to see what it would be like to be a geologist. And I said, oh, that, I want to do that. And, uh, and if, if you don't have that, you can't learn that in the classroom. I'm not saying that my classroom wasn't of value, it was. But you know, <laughs> the on-the-job apprenticeship relationship, I think, is extremely important. I heard that you placed ninth in the Boston Marathon when you <laughs> yes. were younger. Yes. And in the video, your pull-ups were so impressive. Yeah. So uh, how has your fitness routine contribute to your work as a yeah. geologist? Well, of course, initially my, my, my racing, my, my running, and my geology were separate. But of course, for field work, being very fit, of course, is, yes. is a great uh, is a great advantage. And uh, so I learned a lot about how, how to prepare and whatnot. And also, the first year I ran the Boston Marathon, there was a guy who was 58 years old, and he ran well under three hours. He ran two, about two hours and 48 minutes. I said, I don't know any geologist who can run under three hours. You know, never mind a guy who's almost 60 years old. So I said, I should be able to be a field geologist until I'm 60. I, you know, I was 23 then. So that meant you know, I could have a 40-year field, ge field geology career. So that was a, you know, a great inspiration to know my career. I actually stayed doing field, field work until I was 80. So that was part of it. And then the other thing was unexpected, and that is that almost every idea I've had in science and every good title I've had for a came to me when I was out running. Oh, wow. I, I can even remember exactly where I was when the idea came to me. It's an amazing thing. It, it, it's because, you, of course, you're thinking about it unconsciously. And you're out there running, you know, thinking about nothing, and then suddenly this idea comes to you. Mm. And it's all, always when running, or now, I, you know, my knees finally gave up. And uh -oh. it's 80 but now I go out and walk for over two hours every other day. It's the same thing. That's when the ideas come to me. Oh, that's so interesting. <laughs> and, and I understand now, you know, people used to laugh when I told them that, but I understand there's research now that, that indicates that this is, this is nothing abnormal. And I noticed that many of my cohorts, my students and whatnot, are <laughs> out running. Because <laughs> they figured, look, if he can make good ideas, <laughs> it could happen to anybody. <laughs> OK. Thank you very much, Dr. Paul F. Hoffman. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Paul you. F. Hoffman, thank you.